Well, good morning. Chris Atterbury with you. The show is Inside Twins. It's brought to you, as always, by Killebrew Root Beer, locally owned and operated. How memories are created and legends are made. It is a kind of a wet Sunday here. We battled through some weather issues yesterday. Twins bats came alive. They have a chance to win a series against the Cubs today. We're joined by Derek Falvey, president of baseball operations here in studio today. Always great to have you in studio first and foremost. And, you know, when we get you in here, we don't want to waste your time. And so we're going to ask you about topics that are kind of suited to you as opposed to just kind of running through the events of the week. But I want to start with one of the big events of the week, which was you had to unfortunately sit down with Tyler Malley and realize he doesn't get to play baseball for a while with that injury. Coming out of that, you were asked a question about, you know, when you traded for him, you've had multiple guys that show up and and they either get hurt, the risk of trading for pitching, the risk of just pitching in general to help. And you talked about we trust our process. We went back and we look at all of that. That sparks me because how do you do that? How do you go back? I know you do everything intentionally. There's nothing done in this organization just because. So how do you go about doing a a self-audit, as it were, on an incredibly uh, difficult and uh, at times unscientific process? Well, I think we do it all the time, Chris, as um, not just when something goes bad, right, or ultimately when something works out the way it did with, with Tyler. We have I don't know, upwards of 30-plus trades we've made over the last few seasons, right? And ultimately, each one of those, we go back and assess. You know, what was our process? What information did we have? Sometimes we have bad process and good outcome. And oftentimes we spend more time on that and trying to assess, okay, we got a little lucky here. It's a good outcome. Sometimes you get unlucky. You have great process. Everything lines up really well and ultimately you have a bad outcome. So the things that you can control and the things that we feel we can invest our time in, there's risk. There's risk in this sport. And if you're trying to get better and you're doing some things that might take uh, a risk on, ultimately you have to be okay with the outcome of that. And I feel like we always assess that. We always talk about what the risks are. And ultimately we're just, it's all in the pursuit of getting better what's the grayest area when you're going through that process acquiring a new player whether it's signing them or whether it's trading for them is it health where you know there's a risk that anybody could go at any time especially if there's there's stuff before or is it fit and and character because you've had some guys that maybe when they got here weren't what you thought they were or or some guys who were better than you thought they might have been yeah i would say both of those are risks always they're just different types of risks i think the health risk and and sometimes the the realities of that is you don't know everything you don't get your hands on the player when when you're when you're trading for them you certainly get some medical reports you get what they're reporting uh sometimes they've had some imaging done whether it's an mri or an x-ray sometimes they haven't and ultimately it's just maintenance and care that goes into the report when you make that trade you know you're walking into that without full information Uh, it's not a it's not as clean a process as I think maybe the average fan might think it is and ultimately you have to take on that risk to get to know the player to to do the work on the scouting side to evaluate everything you can on the outside and ultimately make the best decision that you can and I feel good about the way our guys have done that the league is so uh, I don't know information based right and streamlined based in terms of Here's how we do it. This is available. This is available. We can know how long a ball is in the air. Yeah. We can know how many uh, tenths of a centimeter it was off the plate or, or whatever. Do you think there'll be a more codified way of, of, of tracking health records of players moving forward? Yeah, I, well, I don't think it's a question always of the record. I think it's just the reality of there's risk in this sport, and certainly with pitching. You know, we're not alone in this. You know, you look across baseball right now, and you see some of the players uh, that, that are getting hurt, right? And there are injuries, and we recognize with with the velocity in the game, with the way these athletes have been trained, this is true in other sports, too. It's just creating more, uh, more risk than there, maybe there was 10, 20 years ago. So, ultimately, that's part of it. But if we never want to take a risk, uh, we can do that, <laughs> Ultimately, yeah. and, we, and we can live on that side of the equation. It won't make us any better, and that's what we're trying to do. You will not be living on that particular – you will not sign Derek Falvey on that side of, uh, of the fence. Let, let's talk about Byron Buxton. We've talked with Buck about this. we talked with Thad about this. We've heard from Rocco on this. It's great that he's able to DH, and he makes you better if he can play every day. He's second-best position player war on your club. He also unquestionably makes you better if he can play in center field. He can steal bases. He can play – the, the, even the very nature of his injuries still remain a bit vague and, and mysterious. Where are we in that process? Is there a point in time where all parties involved get together or 
does Carlos have to cook dinner for everybody and, <laughs> and explain that he needs to play center? Like, what has to happen? Yeah, I, I think it's a combination of conversations. And, and we don't sit here today, I'll, I'll tell you from where I sit, ultimately in this chair and my decision uh, around where we, how our process unfolds with this is it's a partnership. It's with the player. It's with the, the staff. It's with our medical team. It's with everybody involved to see where our team is at this moment in time. What are the alternatives? What's the risk that, that exists there? And ultimately, we'll, we'll spend some time building that in but we're not we don't have a specific date in mind we don't have a day where we're saying this is the day he'd go play center field we want to see how he continues to progress physically uh, we've turned a corner on weather which I think is great ultimately hopefully now we can see what it looks like as we proceed further into the season but we'll assess that really on a week-to-week basis uh, and ultimately right now we feel really good about where he's at physically we feel really good about the contribution you just mentioned we know we're better with Byron Buxton on the field that's our f- primary focus guys like Michael Taylor and others have really stepped up for us and played a good role. So we want to balance that as we go through the season, and ultimately that's where we are today. But if I hear you correctly, there are signposts. There are building signposts in terms of specific physical aspects of it that you're trying to, to reach or to, to build towards. Yeah, but I think when you put a guy out in the outfield, you know, obviously he needs to go through some progressions to get back on. So we've talked about what that looks like in early work, right? When at two o'clock when no one's in the ballpark, you know, some of that shagging work, some of that, you know, running kind of line to line and just see what it feels like as he goes through that, even in a game that night where he just DHs. So we get a feel for how he's feeling coming out of that kind of work. That's the type of uh, first step that we'll take here and then ultimately build that into whether or not we see him in games. How frequent, what that looks like, DH will definitely be a part of his season, and ultimately hopefully we can build off of that. Yeah, and he's done a great job of, of figuring that position out. I mean, he has attacked that no doubt. Uh, intensely from the mental side of it and been fabulous at it, but you have to dream a little bit, don't you, from your chair looking down and going, look, we're getting nothing from left field. Worst in the league offensively. Center field is bottom three in the league offensively. DH is really good. We've got all these other parts that we can use if you can open that up. So do you you have to catch yourself to not try to rush it? Well, I, I think to some degree, sure. But as you just mentioned, when we see an Alex Kirilov come up and do what he's doing, and that allows Joey Gallo to potentially play some of that outfield to gain more production in the corner. If we get healthy, we get the guys that are on the roster in those positions. I feel really good about that. You know, the combination of offense and defense is the way we think about it. And I think Michael Taylor's played an excellent center field for us defensively is in a great spot. So we want to think about how all the parts fit together on a regular basis, not just one side of the game. Yeah, what a wonderful part Michael Taylor has proven to be to this roster. Kind of a low-key offseason signing that has been a, a huge dividend for the Twins. Our show is Inside Twins. It's brought to you by Killebrew Root Beer, locally owned and operated. How memories are created, legends are made. Derek Falvey's in studio. We appreciate everybody joining us on all of our Twins social media platforms. We'll take questions from you in our third segment. Right now we'll take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk about Sweeper Nation. This sweeper that's sweeping baseball from a guy who's probably responsible for this scourge that has been put upon us. All of that's next on your home for Twins Baseball.
Our show is Inside Twins. Derek Falvey is in studio. We're pleased to have you with us all across our great network of affiliates. Also, joining us on our many social media platforms, you can see the sporty vest there uh, that Derek has uh, in studio here today. Been a little bit rainy, but we're ready for baseball chance to win another series in interleague play. The sweeper, that's the hot word. It's not a new pitch, Derek, but it is a differentiation uh, of, of a type of pitch, uh, and it's being thrown with tremendous uh, um, um, success by a lot of guys, including several on your team. It's designed for more horizontal movement. It's not necessarily designed for swing and miss. Um, and it's designed basically, isn't it not, to, to not give up home runs? Is that is that fair? A simplification? Oversimplification? Well, I would say probably all pitches you don't want to give up home runs on, ultimately. I, I think the way to – this is uh, what – for those who watch baseball, as long as many of our fans have that are listening right now and watching right now, the cat and mouse game of hitter pitcher has been going on for a hundred years, and, and it's fun to see every five years, ten years, every decade. There's some changes, right? We talk about the changes in the game. People talk about launch angle and home runs and what's changed over the last few years. Ultimately, now with bat paths that sometimes are a little bit lower and a little bit geared toward the bottom of the zone, because pitches were geared to throw it at the bottom of the zone. Exactly, and a lot of sliders and pitches that move down. Now you have a pitch that actually looks like that pitch, but is moving more horizontally to stay above the bat path, maybe to to get that pop up, to get that guy to swing a little bit underneath, still make contact at times, but maybe fly that, you know, pop that ball out to the infield or to the outfield. So I think it's this constant evolution of how pitchers think. It, as you said, is not a new pitch. It's a slider with a little bit more horizontal movement than maybe. Be a little bit of depth, but ultimately, some guys it's how they think about it, it's the mindset. You know, they want that ball to go a little bit more left to right or right to left, depending on if they're a lefty or a righty, rather than down. Okay, well, you're a guy whose offensive philosophy is centered on the long ball. I mean, you've shown me the reams of data. You guys are fourth in the league, I think, now in home runs. How do you, as a hitter, then? You've got a team of guys working in there with your hitters. How do you combat that? How do you combat knowing that if a Griffin Jacks comes in to face you, you're going to see 71% of them? Yeah, well, I think that's – and we're not alone in that, right? There's uh, teams that – some of the best teams in baseball right now, uh, ultimately offensively, even ones that have performed much better than we have up to this point, have very similar profiles, you know, whether it's home runs, some swing and miss. I look at the Atlanta Braves as a team that really you know, generates a ton of power, but I think as of the other day, it'll look, they had the highest swing and miss rate. But there are situations where – you have to find a way to put a ball in play. And, and there are certain players on your team that are geared a little bit more toward ball in play. We have some of those guys too. So I think it's really trying to make sure that you have the lineup and the group that can adapt and adjust based on what pitcher's on the mound and what approach they're taking against you. You guys are among league leaders in strikeouts. And the teams with you often are teams that are at the tops of their divisions. Uh, but they also hit a lot of home runs. Dodgers jump to mind. Uh, is there some sort of perfect balance line of the ROI you can get on your strikeouts to the home runs where if you're seeing the strikeouts climb and the home runs aren't climbing at an appropriate rate you think oh maybe we have to change something yeah I mean by no means is it a goal for us to strike out I, I want to make that clear right we don't want that to be the outcome it's sometimes a result of some of the profiles as you see Joey Gallo right there and and some of his highlights he has more of that profile uh, but he also does you know, maybe lead our team in OPS at this point and ultimately gives us some some real potential to drive some runs in you know we know that there are going to be balances in that, and we need to get the, that kind of output throughout our lineup. But we also look at playoff baseball, and that's really where we want to be winning. And ultimately what wins in those games is going to be the ability to drive the ball, even to the gaps, not just home runs, but to get some power output in those games. The, the guy we saw chasing Gal there was Kirilov. You just get AK back, and he is not Luisa Rice. But he is a guy who, if you just look at quality of at-bats, has the potential to give you those grinding long quality at bats that end up with hard contact to all parts of the field we saw the power with a certainly evidence to healthy wrist yesterday no first ever career home run straight to the opposite field how excited and what does he add to your team when you get those grinder type at bats consistently from a guy like yeah i mean alex we we were hopeful certainly entering spring training after this last surgery we took it very slowly we wanted to make sure he was as comfortable as possible uh it took a little longer even maybe than we expected at that moment in time but that was okay by us because we wanted him to build confidence and we wanted him to really feel good about where he was at health wise this is what we're seeing right now is what a healthy alex kirloff can do and i, I think that's really fun to see i think it's great for our team i think it balances out our lineup as you just mentioned with a slightly different approach approach and profile. So this is a guy who can drive the ball all over the field. He has home run power, as we see, to both pull side and the opposite field. He also has the ability to grind out in a bat, and I think that's going to be really important for us over the course of a season. 
are you concerned at all with the offense, or do you expect, because of the players who might be struggling, that you know the track record and you see them taking the signs that this will all level out? Yeah, I think that's what we're seeing more of of late. You know, certainly at the front end of the season, we had a few guys that were, were under where you would expect them to be. Uh, but even looking over the last kind of week to two weeks for a guy like Carlos Correa, who we know and watched ourselves the second half of last year really carry us offensively, uh, you're seeing some of that coming back. You're seeing the quality of the contact. You're seeing some of the underlying performance even better than his surface line. He's driving balls to all part of the field. So I think those types of things will come over time. We were in a lag for sure offensively. Uh, we're pitching as good as any team, if not at the, at the top of most marks in the league. So ultimately, if we can match up our offense to where we think it, it can be with that kind of pitching, we're going to be in an okay spot. You know, Danny and I were talking about it last night. Uh, when you have the rotation that you have, you can live with a feast or famine offense a little bit. I mean, you've got a bunch of games where you have four or fewer hits, a bunch of games where you have pound balls into the seats. But if you know from the drop, from the last note of the national anthem, that you're in every game in the sixth or seventh inning, Boy, it only takes one swing. You never feel like, say, for instance, you had poor rotation, explosive offense. You could still be buried early in a ball game. You're never out of a game right now. Yeah, it's it's why everyone talks about pitching and defense, right? The importance of that core and having that through the course of a season. I think we're seeing that now, as you just said. We're in a lot of games. You know, the guys in the bullpen are coming in with one-run games very often, or tie games, or you know, one one way or the other. So I feel like every time we show up in the fifth, sixth, seventh inning, we've still got a shot every night, and that's all you can ask for from your starters. You want to put yourself in a position to win as many games as possible. Our guys are pitching deeper. Our starters are pitching deeper than any. Team team starters in the big leagues right now. We've got the most starting pitcher innings, and I think that's a credit to how efficient, how good they've been, and, and giving us a chance to win every night. That changes your voicemails probably, right, after, <laughs> after last year. Certainly does. Uh, let's take a break away from the big club. You have to have the, the overview. Last night, if you were in Frisco, Texas, you got to see Brooks Lee play third. Royce Lewis played short, probably slept in his own bed too, uh, and he had a couple of knocks in the ball game, and, and they win. Is that kind of fun for you? A, just to have Royce back. He's such a spark of light as well as a very talented baseball player, but to look down – into your double-A level and see that left side of the diamond. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I, let's start with Brooks for a second. He's really he read a nice spring training. He learned a ton. I think he, he, at the front end, was performing well. Then he struggled, and he saw what that looked like in the big leagues. That's just a great experience for a young kid in his first full season of professional baseball. And he went off to Wichita. He's playing a better shortstop than he ever has. He's throwing the ball well. There's all these things that we want him to continue to grow and develop at, and I'm really excited about that. When Royce joined, you know, his first rehab game the other day was against Jack Leiter, who's one of the top young pitching. <laughs> arms minor leagues you know, maybe saw a little more velocity that he'd been seeing in the early rehab start but how about the adjustments he made going into game two you could just see it right away that's what's so special about Royce he has that adjustability that's really quick he's just such a good athlete that he can he can adapt to the game and uh, playing shortstop certainly getting some time at third as well uh, hopefully he's tracking in a healthy place and, and will ultimately be another contributor to the offense that you just mentioned adjustability is that is that a word or is that a fat story <laughs> i don't know you're gonna have to ask that, that <laughs> yeah. he usually does the the bigger words that i do will royce and brooks continue to flip-flop you know mix them around at different spots yeah i think we'll, what we'll end up doing is you know we certainly want both those guys to to play shortstop you know we know that's really going to be a part of of their core and their ability and we know we have carlos correa up mm -hmm. here uh but we just think it's a good thing for those guys to have that in the mix ultimately they're going to royce will get a little bit more third base time we'll get a little bit more third base time as he tracks toward triple a as well so all of these things are in in motion. We just want to keep them on the left side of the infield together. It's great to see him back out and playing. Derek Falvey in studio. We'll take your questions when we return to Inside Twins on your home for Twins Baseball.
Uh, welcome inside our dry and cozy confines here in the network headquarters at Target Field. You see the bustling Thompson Reuters Champions Club behind me. If you are joining us via our social media channels, Derek Falvey and the Natalie uh, attired there with the vest. Uh, we're both sporting the M-Star. So uh, we got it. We're ready to roll on a Sunday. A reminder, we're coming up with our pregame lineup card. Uh, we're going to hear a great little feature on Christian Vasquez and David Ross, teammates now facing off against one another today. And also memories with Mike Radcliffe. Darren Johnson has an amazing story about Cliffy that you will not want to miss today. I'm going to open the segment, and then we'll open to other questions, Derek. Just quickly, today's starter, Louis Varland. I thought his last start, best I've seen him pitch. Uh, the changeup was great. The slider was moving as well as it ever has. And those are his you know, third and fourth pitches. Uh, Velo was ticked up, and he just seemed comfortable. Uh, how happy are you with where Louis is? Yeah, Louis is one of those kids who uh, is a dream all around in terms of the way he approaches the game of baseball. He was not a, a high-profile guy, obviously, in the draft. He's born and bred here in Minnesota. His family gets to come to the games every day. I mean, that's it's a tremendous story. This kid works as hard as anybody. Um, he's always got his head up. You know, even when we've had the times where he's been up here for a start, has to go to the minor leagues, even after he pitched well. I remember we were in New York, and that happened, and he just said, I'm, I'm, I'll be ready. I'm ready for the next time. So I think this is a kid that every Twins fan can get behind and support, and his pitches continue to get better. He's working really hard at it. I'm just really excited for him. All right, let's see what we can dig up question-wise here. We've got, uh, looks like Patrick. Uh, loves your vest. See, I told you the vest was going to be a big hit. Uh, some positions the Twins could be looking at or upgrading in a trade deal. Well, I know I, you're already thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, Pat, I appreciate the, the question here. You know, obviously, as the season wears on, things happen, right? Things change. You get injuries. You, you deal with some performance challenges along the way. We are right now approaching that with a really wide-open lens because our starting pitching staff has been great for us. Our bullpen has stepped up, and the guys toward the back end have pitched well. Um, and the position player club, if we get the healthier version and ultimately some guys stepping in, we feel like we're going to be in an okay spot. That's a good base to start from. doesn't mean you don't think about ways to maybe add Add a little bit. We'll always keep an eye on the bullpen. We'll always keep an eye on ways that we could augment our bench. But we feel like we have some depth right now. It'll probably be – it'll necessitate some need, some changes based on needs as we get a little closer to the end of July. And you can never have enough arms. We know yeah, that absolutely. bullpen-wise. Uh, it looks like most of the comments have delved into an argument over – uh, which trades and are good and which are bad, and two people that probably need to step outside and have a word with one another <laughs> that doesn't involve you or I. So uh, last question for me is we've tapped into the depth already a little bit in the rotation. Is there more bullpen depth coming? Are there more Brock Stewart's you're hiding down there that we don't know about? Well, I think there's some guys that even out of spring training we felt really excited about. Jose De Leon threw the ball well for us a few times. You know, he's gotten on some good tracks there. I think there's some others. Uh, Ortega is a guy who came back and we claimed off waivers has a guy a guy that we think can help us toward the some part of the bullpen. So we know we're going to need extra guys down there. We'll do we'll do everything we can to get them ready. I mean, that's just always the case. No matter how good your guys are, you're always going to need uh, a few extra guys. Are you liking this? unbalanced schedule seeing the the National League teams and teams you're not always accustomed to seeing except every three years yeah I think it's been fun to see some teams come through you know it's it's definitely harder for the preparation you know, for <laughs> yes, a lot of our is. guys and the coaches <laughs> and navigating more teams again but I think it's great overall for the game of baseball you know seeing teams like the Cubs come through Minnesota and giving us a chance to, to get a chance to see that team too and you've been coaching some third there for your little league <laughs> squad have you gotten anybody thrown out at home <laughs> I not yet I don't think but there's really particular rules about when a guy can even go to home the ball has to be in the outfield a good way so uh, I think we'll be okay. I talked to Pedro Grafal he wants you in the box he says uh, he <laughs> wants you in the coach's box uh, next time you're out there on the diamond. Derek always great to see you have a great rest of your Sunday. Well happy uh, Mother's Day to all the mothers out there and uh, to mine who's going to be listening and watching today I'm sure. Happy Mother's right, Day. That does it for Inside Twins. Stick around. Pre-game lineup card is coming up next on your home for Twins Baseball.